Hello everybody and welcome to the Cinefix Top 100, the garden in which the roots are strong enough to support 100 of the greatest movies of all time. I'm Clint Gage and with me as always, Cinefix's in-house medical support staff, Alex Stedman. How's it going, Alex? I'm good. That was a good one, Clint. How are you? Hey, good. I mean, you, you keep getting promoted. You're a doctor I know. now. It's just... Keep on rising. Uh, and, of course, also joining us, the only hope we have of keeping the presidency, Michael Calibro. Cal, what's happening, dude? How's it going, Clint? It's It's going. It's going. We're here talking about another uh, another great movie. This one actually a not top 100, kind of, but it sort of is a top 100 now because last time we spoke, we were talking about the Burbs and we all collectively decided to kick the Burbs off of our top 100 in favor of a movie out of the mystery envelope, Dan's coveted mystery envelope. Uh, so that's the movie we're talking about this week, which honestly, I'm probably more excited to talk about this movie than I was about the Burbs. Uh, we're talking about being there. Being there, 1979 from director Hal Ashby, starring Peter Sellers, Shirley MacLaine. Uh, it's the story of a guy named Chance who he just loves to watch TV. And as one of the characters in the movie puts it, had no brains at all. Areas the stuff with rice pudding between the ears. The single sickest burn I've ever heard. Feel feel like he's like one of the he's one of the earlier man children on TV. You know, just not. Yeah. To like to a very literal almost extent, like he really is a child up there, man. He's just watching a lot of Mister yeah, Rogers. Yeah, you know? Big Bird, Sesame Street. Just a tiny, tiny little baby man. But anyway, he gets to the, he goes out into the real world for the first time as a this middle aged sort of simple minded man, and accidentally, I guess, becomes president. Hey. We'll get to he, the ending he, later, but not <laughs> that quite, might be but that might be a little bit spoilery. He becomes far too influential, is what it is. Yes, yes, uh, more or less one of those things. Either far too influential or accidentally president. Uh, Either or. I think the ending is vague enough that we can we can kind of ex- extrapolate it however we want to. But just from those context clues alone, if you haven't seen this movie. It's, this is a movie to me that it's, it's one of those films that just stays relevant forever. It's probably more relevant today than it was even in the 80s when they made it. And I know that this was like made on the heels of when a actor became president of the United States, which is, you know, they basically made a whole movie off that line in Back to the Future, which I guess would be made four years in the future, <laughs> where it's just like yeah. a port of vision. Ronald like, Reagan? A port of vision. The actor? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, I, like... I mean, this is this is 79, right? So this is when he was running for president yeah. or on the precipice of running for president because his he started his term in 80, right? He would have he would have been elected the fall of 79. Yeah. So they would have been filming it um while he was running. Filming it in yeah, campaign season. Yeah. He would have been governor of California and and running for for president at that point. And it makes sense that like, you know, cuz this movie is so focused on how TV influences us. Oh yeah. It makes perfect sense that a, a, a movie star would become president of the United States. But I don't even think that this movie suffers even for a second today with the advent of the Internet and like how it's like core resolute theme of like how the media influences the way we perceive the world kind of thing. Which is exactly what this movie what's which is exactly what this movie does. And it's just like the power of the personality, which is also still relevant. Is there the power of the personality? Because I think he doesn't have any personality, it's, it's right? It's our willingness to find the personality. Yeah. It's it's all projection. He's a he's a he's a Rorschach test. You know, you just kind of see what he you is want. a completely blank slate. Yeah. And he goes through no growth throughout this entire movie. Everyone around him goes through some weird journeys, but this man stays the same. Because you see whatever you want to see in him. Yeah, and that's part of the thing about the movie that that I think is so is so because it's not his movie no. in so many ways. Like he is he is just an absolute vessel for the theme of the movie, which I mean, there's several, right? There's several really cool. I mean, we're talking about how the media influences us because here's a guy that only watches TV. He literally learns how to shake hands by watching TV. He's like watching, you know, and people a, and do a, that. And, and, and other that's people. how he shakes hands the rest of the and other and yeah, other things, shakes, other types of human interactions. Hands, he does it as the ex- in the exact same way as he saw the president doing it on TV. But earlier. that's so childlike too. Like he is, we've said it before. He's childlike. That's what kids do. They watch TV and they learn from it. There's also like our dependence on screens, 
No, hey, like hey, just hey. Uh, you know, that's. Hey. <laughs> I mean, listen. Don't uh, we're sitting don't here talking to each other? Don't, I'm don't bite talking to you through a screen. <laughs> And then people are consuming this through a screen, through a screen. So like, don't bite the hand that yeah. feeds you. All right. We're, we're screen dwellers too. I do love the part where they're the, the kind of print versus TV journalism aspect of it, where he's like, like, what do you read? Where do you get your news? And he's like, I watch TV. And they're like, wow. Innovator. I watch TV. Again, again all of that yeah. comes before like the 24 hour news cycle, right? Yeah. Cause like well, CNN didn't know. start until the eighties as well. Yeah. You might be right, but they still had local news. So yeah, I mean, this movie feels like it's a it's it's ahead of its time, but it might be like five minutes ahead of its time, right? Like because even even the news cycle, yeah, the twenty four hour like up. TV news cycle, yeah, yeah. I mean, right. CNN, right? Like that came around in the early eighties, didn't it? Like a year later, yeah, yeah. Then, hold on, let me look it up. Let me look it up. Dude, okay, so CNN started on June first, nineteen eighty. Yeah, so. Literally, Reagan becomes so president, like and then the, four months, yeah. si- six months later, the twenty-four hour news cycle happens. So now we're just like definitely living in the TV world. That's so crazy, actually. Being there was made uh, nine months before all of that. Like that is the cutting edge of all of this stuff. Like that. I mean, movies that can be like just a split second ahead of some massive trend in society. Like those are the movies that last, right? And this is this is one of them for me. This is like right on that list of of just eternally relevant movies. But we've already kind of touched on a couple couple brilliant moments from the thing. So let's let's get through the pedigree of this this movie first before we get. Uh, you know, it did critically very well received. Um, Melvin Douglas won for best supporting actor. The the Ben Rand, the the old old man rich guy character. The guy on Adrenochrome won for best supporting. <laughs> yeah i want fresh blood for dinner I, I want blood for um, din- <laughs> he won for best sporting actor because you know that's what hollywood runs on is adrenochrome even even back in those days <laughs> peter sellers <laughs> was nominated for best actor but he lost to dustin hoffman uh, for kramer versus kramer but listen oh, yeah. listen to this murderer's row of a best actor category in in the 1980 academy awards it was dustin hoffman who who won then there's Peter Sellers nominated for being there. Jack Lemmon nominated for The China Syndrome. Al Pacino nominated that year for And Justice for All. And Roy Scheider for All That Jazz. Oh, God damn. Like, that is a hell of a category. I, I mean, honestly, three, um, of the, three of those nominees are like career, career highs on performance. You can't even yeah. be mad about I mean, losing that year. Because I remember when I was looking up the, pred- the pedigree... Um, I was like, how is Peter Seller not the Oscar winner for this? It's because yeah. it's that. Yeah, but Fosse and all yeah. that jazz is a is a tough combo to beat yeah. too. Like that yeah. that movie rips. Yeah. The competition yeah. was way too well, tough. Dustin Hoffman, Jack Lemmon. I mean, like any year where Dustin Hoffman, Jack Lemmon, Al Pacino, Roy Scheider, dude, Peter Seller, like that's in, that's incredible. That's a Hall of yeah, Fame. Yeah, Clint. That's I mean, you nuts. You and I went on a went on a long uh, discourse about that on the Midnight Cowboy about just like his just on his his run in the 70s yeah which is just nuts um a lot of people went on crazy runs in the 70s uh hal ashby the director of this film included but before we get to that i I also want a quick shout out to a completely unrelated category that year that i found really compelling best visual effects at the 1980 oscars was 1941 the black hole moonraker star trek the motion picture and and our guy douglas trumbull uh but the winner that year alien hr oh. giger and, and and pals so like hell that yeah. was a hell of a long all that to say 1979 was a hell of a year uh, what the uh, f- is 1941 <laughs> doing there best visual effects yeah i'm That's trying the, to think of what the visual, courtesy i'm trying to think of what visual effects there i mean i guess there were a couple because it was te- i mean it's technically a war movie but like it's f-ing comedy yeah yeah, it, it takes place half in the air, I think, right? I mean, I explosions Sp- and stuff. Spielberg's biggest I, I don't, bomb. I, to be honest, I don't think I've ever seen that whole movie. Being there did a little bit better at the BAFTAs and the Golden Globes. Like Shirley MacLaine got nominated. Hal Ashley got some got some nominations. Uh, best screenplay, motion picture also. Um, and Sellers actually won the Golden Globe uh, because it was a comedy, I guess, and didn't have to compete with Dustin Hoffman again. Did it win, be- did it win best comedy or musical that year or do you not know? It was nominated for best motion picture. It was nominated. Didn't didn't win. Didn't win. Did was there win. like a Martian esque, you know, just like cheating to get into the comedy, the comedy? <laughs> yeah, probably. You know, I laughed at the Martian. I would call it comedy. Yeah, it had two jokes. Sure, there are a couple. It had a, it had a handful of jokes. <laughs> it was sure. lighthearted. Listen, I'm gonna it wasn't sign. Interstellar. 
You remember that line? I'm gonna science the shit out of this. Yeah, that's a comedy. That's a joke. That's a comedy <laughs> yeah. line. And you know what? I the whole, the whole space pirate bit. Absolutely. But maybe the the most important bit of of pedigree and, and our favorite one. Uh, being there does have a Criterion spine number, number eight sixty four. So congratulations to being there, and the Criterion channel. That is how I've seen this. The, uh, the first time I watched this movie was thanks to the Criterion Collection DVD of this. There you go. Pre Blu pre nice. Blu ray, which I'm proud of. Peter Sellers too, like this is kind of at the tail end of his career uh, because he died in the next year. He died in, in the summer of, of 1980 of a heart attack, which apparently he'd been dealing with heart issues for like 15 years or something at that point. They, they caught up with him. But I, this was, he got a lot of attention for this movie because everybody was, he was just doing the same Pink Panther stuff, Inspector Clouseau stuff kind of over and over again. In fact, I saw, I saw one quote, I can't remember where it came, I should have written it down, but it was something along the lines of like, I've never seen such a great talent make so many bad movies as Peter <laughs> Sellers. I mean, Pink Panther it's like alone. Peter, <laughs> Peter, I mean, listen, the first, there's a reason they made a dozen other Pink Panther movies because he was, he was that good mm -hmm. in the first, as Inspector Clouseau in the first Pink Panther movie and, and some of the, some of the subsequent ones he was, he was funny in too, but it was just the same thing over and over again. But like the high watermarks for him, like the, with Lolita and Dr. Strangelove and then being there again, right here at the, at the end of his life where the man can, you know, he, he hits him home runs for sure i mean this is a hell of a one to go on this is a real passion project for him too if i'm not mistaken is it yeah i think so i don't think anybody i mean it has to be right because i just don't think anybody else could have pulled this movie off especially at this time because this is like yeah the kind like it's kind of the antithesis of what acting was at that time right he's a blank slate and even when you look at all of the people he was nominated against for academy awards they're kind of like very much the actor inhabiting the role like being themselves but in the role you know uh dustin hoffman and kramer versus Carol kramer is very dustin hoffman -y in that i mean he's great and you definitely believe him but it's not like he's stepping outside of Dustin Hoffman to inhabit the role of Kramer yeah. and the same thing, the same thing with Roy Schneider and the same thing with Al Pacino. It's like, that's like, that's the air of like the personality actor. And this is a movie that is in direct conflict to that because what we've just been saying this entire time is he's a Rorschach test, right? He has no personality. Everything, everything that you think there is about him is, our manifestation, like our internal manifestations on it. It's just a blank slate. I do wonder what the Oscar clip for that was, you know? Because like there is no obvious like catharsis. I like, uh, I like to watch. Yes, 100%. Which one? He says it twice. I like to watch. My whole journey through the movie too was trying to figure out if he really was this genius or if I was being stupid. But okay, We'll I mean, get to it. We'll get to I, it when we get to I, I think, I think that's what the children's TV is like really yeah. there to hammer home is like yeah. any, like he's sitting next to a dead man and he puts on the TV to watch cartoons. We're going to, we're going to have to talk about the ending. Cause I, we'll get to yeah. that too. Cause I, I also, yeah, I also want to credit the, the camera work and the editing for some of, of how we, the audience interpret, but we'll get to some of that too. Cause there's a, there's a couple of shots in particular that I thought that I was in revisiting it at this time that I was weirdly blown away by, but, but the other half of the, the lead in it, Shirley MacLaine. Oh, yeah, she's great. She's great. She's so, so funny. Good. So, and, and at this point in 1979, she's, she's more or less a legend already. Like her legacy is kind of cemented at this point. She'd been nominated for some awards before. I, I recently went back to the apartment not too long ago and she's just so good in that too. Like it's, Shirley MacLaine is, is incredible. And like the, the stuff and like the tragedy that is underneath everything about her character and like everything that she's sort of going through and to, but also she's being not manipulated is the wrong word because there's nothing intentional about what Peter Sellers' character is doing. But like, there's something there's, I, I don't know. You just, you feel sorry for her and also you understand her. And also you're like, what do you, what do you, well, you, you kind of, you're stupid. Like, what are you I'm doing? But you like, there's that, humanity underneath all of it. I was like, am I making it too deep? But I really felt sad for her because you could really just tell she yes. was seeking out connection so badly. And to that point yes. where it's a Rorschach test, where it's like, all she wanted was connection. All she wanted was something different. 
But do you blame her? Yeah. Her husband no. is literally cheating death on a daily basis. That's like why this, so sad. This, this guy is so rich. He can reverse engineer his house to house more oxygen than what the air can normally contain. <laughs> <laughs> he's changing the air. He's literally he's literally rich enough to change the composition of the air in his own house. Which is, <laughs> which is just that's it. I mean, listen, th those are goals. Yeah. You know, you have those. It goals. makes me think of like Rupert Murdoch, who has stayed alive by drinking these super smoothies every morning. Like it's Rupert Murdoch I mean, rich. Listen, this, cheating death rich. Yeah. This is thirty years before the ad adrenochrome like joke, but he literally has a line where it's just like. Uh, nurse, I would like some fresh blood before I go to dinner. Yeah, <laughs> what, what yeah, mean? getting getting a transfusion. Yeah, he's get, and he's getting uh, a tra he's getting a transfusion in his basement while uh, Chance is getting X rays right next to him. So he has his own he yeah. has his own X ray machine. Which like if you've ever seen the bills from getting X rays on our health insurance, it's just like Cygnus. Just it's like, probably cheaper to buy your own X ray machine. Welcome. I thought he was yeah. referring to Chance as fresh blood. Oh no! Is, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> that was that no, was he literal. Got a, yeah, he got a uh, no. Yeah, he's he got getting a, transfusion a literal transfusion before dinner, so uh, he could yeah, have he, he could have the energy to. You know what? I'm sticking yeah. with my interpretation. Literally both. This Do is it. everything. That's yeah. the whole. Literal that's and the metaphorical. whole point of this movie <laughs> is just interpret well, it however you need to. That's what I did. This whole to. movie was um, was trying <laughs> to find something deeper, and then I'm like, am I all the rich people in this movie trying to find something deeper when it's not? I think that's the great. I mean, you know, a little bit. I mean, that's that's again, like you know, the the many layers to what this movie can can do if you want it to like i because like there's a version of that you know is, is this what i do to is this is this how we treat movies like movies can just show it's up how and i was they, treating we, it like, there was no intent behind anything maybe in in movies but we're like oh i see what you're doing there and how many interviews have you wanted to add like junket type interviews where you've asked a filmmaker a question that you're hoping for some really like in the weeds deep thoughts answer and they're like I don't know. I thought it looked cool. No, my favorite one of those is the answer that's like, you know, <laughs> I hadn't lot, thought of it right? that way. <laughs> like, right. oh, oh no, you really really dug into that too <laughs> far. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. But we're real quick before we get into to more of those brilliant moments. Let's talk about Hal Ashby. Hal Ashby, I think, is is I I believe him to be decently unheralded. I, I think I agree he's with that. I think he was a a great uh, director. He made a lot of very interesting films from The Landlord, um, which I really like, which is, uh, um, this is, you know, this, about gentrification in Park Slope, actually. Hey, um, yeah, which, there you go. Uh, does it say Park Slope? Hey, I might Char in that fine print. I this can't tell. Flatbush. I'm not in the room with uh, you. No, but this is Charlene's is a bar in, in Park Slope in Brooklyn. Great. Well, he might've made a movie <laughs> about how they, they're ruining Brooklyn. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, but that was a great movie. Harold Maude, I my, probably his most uh, one of his most famous. If being there is not, I would it. say so. That's what I yeah. know Hal Ashby from is Harold Maude. But then the last detail and shampoo and coming home, like that's how he spent his seventies. All those movies, like that's a decade decade of work. I agree for him. I agree with you. I think he's like the most seventy, one of the most like seventies directors. Because like I don't think these movies could exist in any other decade. But to your point. Outside of Harold and Maude, I do agree that some of these are less heralded films. But when you do discover them, they're just like they're so good. They're so good. Well, because they all they all say something. That's what like I see bits of the landlord in being there, and you know it's he's also he came up as an editor. He cut in the heat of the night and the Thomas Crown affair, are probably the two biggest biggest things that he cut. But editors make the best jump to directors. Like they just, they understand story. They understand how to build a thing. Um, and even they got to understand the visual side of things too, just because they're the one juxtaposing those I was, images next I to was each just other. Gonna, so I was just going to say, there are some masterful juxtapositions in this film that we'll get to. Let's let's talk about some brilliant moments here. But let's just start with all of Act One, right? Because I mean, it's so tight, it's so tight, right? From the moment he literally wakes up in the morning to the second he walks out of the house, and the and the funk thus spoke Zathora track is just playing. Is that is that how it's pronounced, Zarathustra? Uh, yes, some something something in there. Also. Also spake Zarathustra, the the 2001 music. Yeah, I was just going to say, my stupid brain yeah. just is like, oh, 2001. 
To be fair, that's what my caption said on the Am- when I was watching it on Amazon. That's what the caption said. Yeah. 2001 place. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. It said 2001 <laughs> yeah. place? Wow. That's, that feels. I know. It, it threw me like off too. I, I was like, like huh. <laughs> correct. Yeah. But I, I think that that very, the first opening sequence, the first part of that opening sequence where he wakes up and he's going about his day and he's, he's mimicking a conductor that he sees on TV in like his day to day life, which honestly, like I, I love, I, I feel like I talk about this every time we do one of these now, but like. Though the movies that efficiently teach you the language of the film, like right up front, are so impressive to me. So like here is us watching, uh, you know, footage of a director and then a guy sort of imitating that director. And then already like we're, we're, yeah, we're applying his daily life to some sort of brilliance, Mm -hmm. right? Like there's already that juxtaposition happening. So later when people start doing it, we've already seen it because we've already done it ourselves. Like we've already watched this guy in like right next to a symphony conductor, you know, but he's just like dusting a flat tire in the garage is all he's doing. Like the fact that he dusts a flat tire in the garage is so funny to there's me. There's something but. about the morning routine openings. Like this is a very, very different movie, but I think about American Psycho. There's something about seeing someone in their daily routine that just really humanizes them and makes them very relatable. Right. Even if you don't start your morning this way. I don't know. I am such a sucker for that trope. The morning routine opening. Yeah, it's just so good because it's just like it does it does everything that the rest of the film is going to hinge on and it does it so fast. But like in a way that it doesn't look like it doesn't look like it's gasping for air as it sprints to get through the first act, you know? So you watch him mimic the TV and that's going to play, be a thing that play that, that pays dividends throughout the rest of the film. You also watch him sit down and very closely watch the children's programming, which is another thing that he like constantly goes back to. Then the, you know, whose house it is like the, the rich old man that employed them, Right. He dies. And the way that he talks to I think your name is Louise, right? Louise, my girl. Yeah. The way he talks to Louise and how Louise is just like, well, he's dead. But she also knows he's kind of a dimwit, but like doesn't just go like, you idiot. I, I must interrupt to talk about Louise. Yeah. I was saying this before when I was marking the scenes that I loved. Half of them involve Louise. She's in like three scenes. She is not in that much of the movie, yeah. but I think she's so good in that scene too because when I was watching it for the first time last night, you know, she's so shocked by him. At least that's what it seemed to me that I was like, is she worried that he's a sociopath or something? But no, she was just kind of being like, oh God, he's so dumb. Yeah, no, And you she's learn that throughout, how, but yeah, you don't know that survived. initially. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's exactly she, what it she is. Knows she's like so yeah, worried about it. She knows him. exactly, yeah, she knows exactly who he is and like what this means to him. And, and she can see that he doesn't realize what it means to him because he's just sitting there going like, could I have my breakfast now? And like, <laughs> it's, it's nuts. Like there are parts of this opening sequence. So it, it's 20 minutes before he leaves the house. In, into the movie so like it's it does it's an act one that does take its time in spite of being at like all of the information that gets communicated in the first 20 minutes it's a lot and there's a lot of you know emotional stake like we get invested in, in this guy's survival right along with louise like we can tell louise is concerned about him literally finding meals um and also did does she mention that he's got a little? Yes, yeah, she does. I point? have that written down. Because I was. <laughs> she's thing? like, you need, you need to find yourself a lady. Chance it better be You're an old gonna, lady. Yeah. And then she insults his dick and says that he's always yeah. going to be a little boy. My my initial thought you're was not, his you're penis. not going to do a young woman any any good with that little thing of yours or whatever. And then, well, I was I I was wondering if she was talking about like his personality or like whatever I in mean, his head it, is making a him a child. As a euphemism for his penis, I don't know. Well, you could you could take it both ways. Like, <laughs> I I also started to wonder like what does that mean? Does that mean that she's literally been bathing him? Like, surely not. I think he can um, wipe his own ass, Clint. I don't think he's. Yeah, yeah he's, I do. T- I would like to think so. Anyway, I, look, it was a, it was a weird. Is, is the kindest and most savage person in this movie at but once. Like she will yeah. just say the rudest stuff, but she really cares. She's so kind. We we move on from that to the the scene. The lawyers show up to to you know, sort of close up the house, and that scene is legit difficult to watch. Like it's it's just uncomfortable, and you feel so sorry, and you can just see him getting railroaded, right? You can just see what's going to happen to this to this guy. He's going to get kicked out of the house and, and who knows, 
what you know he's going to starve to death in the next six days but he's just kind of he just wants to please everybody. he just wants to say like no i don't need to make a claim or because he doesn't even know what it is and it's uh, but that scene in particular with these two lawyers was was hard for me to watch this time. I felt so bad. But for the that guy. scene also pays dividends later. Later, when he yeah. gets hit by the car, and they ask if he if they're going to make a claim. You know, like probably what I watching it this time around, and we'll get to it more and more as we talk more about about the movie. Is like how tight the miscommunications are in order to. M- in order to suspend the disbelief that these people can believe Chauncey Gardner is – or Chance the Gardner is capable of being president of the United States. Yeah. And, and they're so yeah. well written and so, you know, meticulously like uh, – you know, like tended to. Well, to your point, like at my earlier point about am I being stupid? There were some lines where I was like, "Oh, bars!" Like he's spouting wisdom, and he wasn't. No, he's not. No, he's just he's talking not. about. He he's just is. talking about gardening. He's literally yeah. talking Garden. about how that's flowers. Literally, grow. Yeah. yeah. But like, there's like there are moments yeah. where you're like, "Oh, that's okay, so, I get it." But that's what's so great about it. He's <laughs> yeah. just talking about gardening, and then everybody's just but like, "Oh, you know, yeah. there, businessman's kind of being a like line. a gardener." <laughs> that's so yeah, good. yeah. And the the fact that he's just a a well groomed and dressed white man, everybody assumes that he's like, oh no, you're talking about the businesses that the tax man stole by, from by, you. Like, oh, I hear that. By the way, <laughs> like, by the way, his outfit the last time he tends the garden, f-ing bowler hat and the suit and yep. tie and the pants hiked up like. The pants rolled. Oh, up. he's got a few good fits in this movie. That's, I'll say that that is a that that's is a Halloween tight, costume that is a material tight right there. Cut. That man is. Yeah. Listen, the old man. I don't. Did, did they ever say his name? Like the old man that died. I don't know that they do. Uh, uh, yeah, do the lawyers knew the name. He's Griffith or oh, something like that. Right. I don't. I don't think it matters. Uh, but I think but. he kept him dressed well. Well, his, pe- his stuff. His suits were made in the twenties. <laughs> in the twenties, by a by a tailor that killed himself later, which we find out. <laughs> we, we found find out more about out the tailor the than we do about. I love that the, the ex the uh, FBI yeah. ex- expended resources on finding a fucking suicidal tailor from the twenties yeah. on who made. Well, <laughs> the, the, these are the only <laughs> records that this man exists. Which we're, this, this yeah, I mean that's one of the other things in talking about this movie is that it's easy to jump around a little bit because all of these like. No pun intended. Seeds are planted in the beginning uh, and tended like a gardener. I'm <laughs> intending the pun at this point. And then they, they pop back up later to the point where like there's a line right at the tail end of the movie where one of the – one of the guys that they're talking about like are we really going to you know pick Chauncey to, to go run for president or whatever? And one of the guys says uh, he hasn't said anything that can be held against him. Which is hilarious Which is so because true. he hasn't said anything at all, and it's it's such peak politics. That's exactly what it is that that the idea that this idiot can just be talking about gardening and to power brokers, and people assume that he's talking about the national economy. Yeah, we're gonna get like, it's it's bananas. We're gonna get to the dinner scene, and like that scene in particular is just in Wayne Manor. Before we get there though, <laughs> let's let's get him let's get him leaving. Oh yeah. Leaving the Dude, house. Just, because as soon as he leaves the house and also Sprock Zarathustra the funk remix starts Amazing. Playing. Amazing track. Although according to Amazon Prime captions, the 2001 It's the 2001 it, song. Yeah. yeah. And this track goes for I don't know, 5 solid minutes. Like it just goes and Some goes and serious goes. cinematography there. Like that shot of him walking up the like the the separator of traffic toward Capitol Hill, like yeah, there is there the is Esplanade. Yeah. I believe that's is that what, what an Esplanade called? is? I believe so. Also, also just like another seed where like he gets confronted by the teens and <laughs> we know <laughs> and and, he, and, he, and he's just like, do you know? And then when he sees like the black doctor later, he's like, do you know Raphael? Well, no, there's like yeah. a lot of like so these- very casual racism in this movie. Like uh, even before the Raphael scene, he comes across a black woman on the street and asks her for food because Louise used to give yeah. him food. Like, and it's like, obviously he's just really stupid, but it's, it, it's like not even a microaggression. <laughs> it's just like yeah. terrible. Well, I mean, that's the thing too about like, about putting, putting that behavior on this stupid guy mm-hmm. so that you know, as a way to show how stupid it is, you know, which is 
you know, it's it's an it's, interesting. It's way great. To find that it's stuff. incredible. But him going out and seeing the world for the first time, what I what I really like too about you know, because we at this point we'd all heard the two thousand one music and sort of we know like that is kind of the dawn of man discover you know discovering weapons or whatever that was in, in 2000 who, who knows the dawn that? of whatever the dawn of point TK. is the dawn of the, yeah <laughs> exactly and especially him leaving the home and the choice to have the home in like a crumbling neighborhood uh is i think really really interesting because the first thing we see when he walks outside is the the house is next to just this vacant lot um and then he's you know it's so far from like the I don't know if the house that he grew up in would be considered opulent, but it was certainly nice. I think you're expecting him to walk out and there's like this lush greenery. I, 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 and- I, I, would, I would say the house is opulent. I mean, the man had the man I mean, had a lot, the man had a lot of help. Right. There was Louise, a gardener who clearly never stepped foot outside. Also, side note, Clint, the one thing I can't stop thinking about this movie is like, is this a proto Yargos movie? <sighs> Oh, well, maybe. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if, if this is on Yorgos's top one. Yeah, because I mean like a man who is never – like it's literally the, – the first act could be misconstrued as like dog tooth. You know, it's just a, a person yeah. who never left the house and now they have to leave the house and weird circumstances happen to them. You know, he also mentions at one point he was never allowed to leave the house. Well, I also like how like, little that, you learn that about mean? that. Like, it's the weirdest situation. He has lived in this house apparently forever, yeah. but it never, it's never explained. Great. It doesn't, it no, doesn't, it doesn't it. need like to be. It, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't you know, matter. like I, 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 we have all discussed movies that come out this year that have suffered because there's too much exposition. Like if you just leave, left a couple of things in modern movies ambiguous, People might think the movie is smarter than it actually is. <laughs> oh, I kept waiting for them to explain it. And I was and around the halfway point, I was like, oh, we're never going to figure this out. And I'm fine with it. Just a whole bunch of Chauncey Gardeners out there. It's, that's all we need. Because honestly, like, you know, it's it's just another thing for us to project, right? Like we hear these lines about like, you'll never do anything good with your little thing. And then also I was never allowed to leave the house. So, so like... I don't know if you want to make this a dark movie. Like, here's this guy that's been abused for his well, whole life. Well, that's what I was thinking. Uh, it know, can get really like, dark if you let it get. Yeah, if you want it, if you want it to, you know. And so, like, that's and and that's all of the other characters in the movie. It's what they're doing to Chance as well. Like, they're just projecting whatever it is they need or whatever it is they want to see. Um, and he's all, he's just talking about flowers the whole time, which is wild. So he spends a day walking around DC to the 2001 music. Uh, and of course he gets hit by a car while he's watching TV, hit, by the way. Oh yeah. With the while he's clicker, watching himself like on TV, he's trying to like click around on himself on TV. I do like that. He, there's a couple of times in the movie where he gets tired of seeing himself on TV and changes the channel. So like the, the scene where he sees himself in the, the store window with the camcorder set up, like he's trying to change the channel even then. And that's when he backs up and gets gets backed into um, happily by, I guess, the richest person in America. I mean, um, dude, she has a TV world, in her maybe. car in the 70s. <laughs> it's like having two fridges. It is, it is 2023. And only recently, I, I guess you could say I technically have a TV in my car because I can watch YouTube on my phone and broadcast the audio through. Didn't we talk about this in the Burbs episode? How many TVs you have? <laughs> this movie is also ahead of its time. There is a lot of TVs and weird rooms in this movie. Just to convey the he's always watching TV kind of motif. But even in the house with the dead man, a lot of TVs. A lot of TVs. A lot of TVs. I mean, I mean, I guess if we're if we're splitting this movie into sections, right? There's the there's the first 20 minutes before he leaves. There's him leaving. And then there's him arriving at the Rand's house. Like Shirley McLean's driver backs backs up into him. And then and it, even their interaction there, there's concern that they might get sued. Is what a, is what I oh, it's, read? Yeah. It oh, as. absolutely. So, like, I mean, that's yeah. I mean, the so doctor. She's like, no, no, no. Just come to the house, and we'll save all the fuss. And you don't need to go to a doctor. A out of it. We you have a doctor. Make, you won't make a claim. We have a doctor at our house. I'm glad you just also felt that house. way because I was like, am I being too cynical about the rich people? And no, I no, feel like no, that's absolutely what they were not. Doing. And I mean, yeah. the doctor, the doctor, like, you know, shows the hand later, and he's just like, so you're not going to make a claim, right? And then he's just like, well, you know, I uh, interestingly enough, I talked to two other lawyers today. <laughs> he's so yeah. stupid. Yeah. Like he's just. Oh, you want to deal with your lawyers? Oh, oh you want? No, I don't think yeah. so. <laughs> 
Like he says just enough to say sentences. Yeah, exactly. And that's it. And it's just like, and then everybody else just kind of takes it from. It's there. just a you know, literal like, coincidence that he also interacted with another lawyer that day, and then it is yeah. misconstrued, which is what I'm talking about. About this movie is it's just layer and layer of like beautifully choreographed misunderstandings that are totally yeah. plausible. Well, my favorite one was the elevator. Yes. Yeah. I 30, I mean, this is at like 34 some odd minutes into the movie. There's right after he gets to the Rand's house oh. and he's riding up in an elevator with one of the servants. And that is, that is so perfectly, uh, the perfect example of everything else that happens in this movie, right? Like it's, there are two separate conversations going on here and they're both having them perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's great. Just to backtrack for a second before we get back into the house, uh, we're ta- we, we were talking yet earlier about um, the brilliance of editing juxtapositions in this film. Uh, him listening to the Basketball Jones song and watching it on TV as it pulls up yeah. to the house and he gets out and walks in. And, you know, that juxtaposition, you know, emphasizing his – the beginning of his political ascent – is just right. well that's a confusing that's a confusing choice at first but then you get it later because it's like why is basketball jones well, you play? know what the best part about basketball jones is is and is, is like it also kind of feels like a schoolhouse rock song so it kind oh, yeah. of it kind of plays into that you know childish motif that chauncey is going for but at the same time it's actually making a comment about like superstardom and all of that is juxtaposed against him walking into the mansion for the first time and the person who is going to be the architect of his political ascent it's just it's incredible this is it's top notch It's, it's shockingly smart again this isn't his movie no no like he's just he's just there to illustrate a bigger point about all the people that are around him. I mean, they are a little bit poor though, that they don't have a television in the elevator. I mean, sat. I can't believe it. I was can't thinking like it. that would be fun to have a TV in the elevator. Yeah. But I will like the elevator was so good because that was the first one where I was like, wait, am I misunderstanding it? And for like half a second, I was, it's so believable. I've never been in one of these before. It's one of Mr. Rand's since he's been ill. See. There's a one shot in particular, the shot that actually I had to stop and rewind and watch it again. And then I sort of started watching the movie with this in mind. But there's a shot at like right at 50 minutes into the movie. Um, and it's the one where uh, they're walking, they're going to bed. He's still in the wheelchair. So there's a guy pushing him and he's talking with with Shirley MacLaine's character, Eve. And it's uh, it's where he asks if she's, you know, are you going to close up the house when Ben dies? Um, and it tracks with him for a minute, for a little bit, but it stays on this wide shot for more or less a whole minute um, where there's – and, and it's, it's very wide and he is facing away from the camera. You can't even see him because there's a – uh, you know, there's the guy standing behind him anyway, and Shirley MacLaine is in profile, and we're just across the room in this big wide shot. And he asks, "Are you going to leave and close this house when Ben dies?" And it's such a it's such a strange moment because there's a lot going on in that moment. There's there's you know, it's so loaded with weirdness and misunderstanding and like hurtful things for uh for eve to have to talk about but we're like camped out in this huge wide shot for the whole for the whole scene it's like a minute of this and it's just so awkward and it, it, honestly the what i was trying to figure out why i was so taken by the shot and I, I think that ultimately it feels like we're in the room but i wonder if we're not supposed to be from the perspective of one of the servants in this in this shot and so there's a kind of that because that's the kind of distance that we're watching it from, and I think it puts Eve at at a sort of disadvantage in this in this interaction, right? Almost like a judgmental kind of distance um, to where because we've already seen how they interact with the help, uh, so to speak, in 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 this, and so like I wonder if there's something about the distance that we you that we that we stay at in in scenes like that that allow us to kind of judge eve for how she's reacting to him because we know he's dumb but she doesn't know he's dumb yet and I, it's 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 anyway all that to say it's a fascinating way to photograph the the and this sequence in the house for there's like a, a stretch of movie here 
where I feel like that's all we get. Like that's the distance that we keep from everybody. And we only really get good close-ups of the doctor who frankly like sees right through. It takes chance. It takes the doctor. It takes the doctor a minute, but I get where you're coming from, from this shot. And you know what I think it's interesting? Cause like, I also think that this is kind of mirrored when he meets the president, which is like, it's like two steps forward and one step back in the relationship. It's like enough to make him sound smart, but just like, an eccentricity to make him, for lack of a better word, feel eccentric. And at that moment in time, the people don't realize that he's stupid, but they just acknowledge it as an eccentricity. On television, Mr. President, you look much smaller. Uh, I must warn you that Chaucer is not a man to bandy words. <laughs> oh, really? And I think like that, that like what watching those moments from that far back, especially like this early on in the, in 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 the movie, is allowing you to take this scene in from a uh, objective perspective as, as opposed to a more like subjective close up where you would be in a room looking at Chauncey Gardner as Shirley MacLaine is seeing Chauncey as opposed to just like taking it back, watching the interactions between the two of them and kind of like, you know, understanding that there's something off here. You know, it, you need that distance to feel that there's something off. Well, for me, it just feels like we're not supposed to be there. It feels like an intrusion. And I feel like maybe that's part of his, the way he socially interacts with the world. He asks the questions that you're not supposed to ask, but that's why people like him so much. Especially this, this moment in particular would have been so easy to cover like just bounce in and get two over the shoulder close ups for this for this line because it's an emotion. This is like the first time that Eve has, you know, that she's dealing with the fact that her husband is is on death's door in front of us, right? Like it could have been these. It could have been a moment where we get to know it, where we get some empathy towards her and we start to get invested in her. But instead, we're we're just camped way the hell back on the other side of the room. It it was a it's a fascinating choice, I think. And just like everything else in this in the movie, it's it's kind of a Rorschach. Like it's kind of a blank canvas where, you know, I think all three of us read it in a little bit of a different different light. Yeah. And I too also felt like it was supposed to just be like we're yeah. surrounded by richness while they're talking about really serious stuff. We're just surrounded by the, all this wealth. Yeah, the great news is that this is a Rorschach test, so we're all yeah. right. We yeah, did it. exactly. <laughs> all of all of us are right. Just Congratulations, pat yourself guys. on the back for your proper interpretation. The scene <laughs> uh done. done did it you mentioned when he meets the president and it's one of the one of the biggest laughs that i that this movie got out of me was when the president he is saying like his hands. did you get the chance to did you get the chance to read my and every time he says chance yeah. chance goes <laughs> yes yes <laughs> he does it twice <laughs> the president's just looking at him like the hell is that? It's so anyway, that, that's just one of those. Yeah, for for everything else that this movie does in such a, a really sort of smart, multi layered way, like that was just like great comic timing for a second, and nothing else. You know, um, that's just Peter Sellers being funny. So that was funny. really funny. I want to I want to backtrack a little bit though. Is the dinner scene before the president scene? Yes. Yeah. We haven't we haven't even gotten to the transfusion scene yet or anything oh, yeah. like that. So we got to. This is just like the introduction because then he goes to talk to the doctor after this and like right i think it's after this. i think it is i think it's yeah because the dinner scene's around like 43 so i think the dinner scene is after he gets a transfusion where it's one of my favorite lines constance i want fresh blood for dinner i'm sticking with my interpretation of the fresh blood i think there's two meanings and i'm gonna stick with that he did have a lot of, there was a lot of joy in his, in yes. his oh, saying, Constance. I want fresh blood for dinner. So there's, it's entirely possible that he was, he was being cheeky about it in, in a couple of you ways. You could be but, cheeky and get a train. Lit the literal meaning is that he was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at, at, it could have been a double entendre, but that's how they say it. But yeah, that dinner scene is where we first see, you know, the scene that's just with, with Ben and Eve uh, and the doctor having dinner the first time that he sort of gets introduced and just how quickly Ben uh, wants to believe it's like, Oh, you're just a put upon businessman who didn't have a chance. And now you lost it, which like, I have some of those lines actually know, written down. Chauncey, verbatim. Chauncey didn't say a, didn't say a word. He just, he just, he just talked about gardening. He was just a white dude. And, and it's yeah. just, it's just, 
the line is, the businessman today is at the mercy of kid lawyers at the SEC, which is just like, holy shit. How the, the the cognitive dissonance to go from him talking about gardening to uh, and and uh, like he's uh, and and he's talking about how lawyers shut down the house. Now he wasn't actually talking about gardening. Now I think about it, it's just like yeah, they shut down the house. Yeah. And then he's like, oh, by house, well, do you shut down your business? By house, you mean business? <laughs> yeah, these the SEC is a bunch of fucking wolves. You know, it's wild nuts it's i love it. one of the things that i love about this movie too is like how willing everybody is to jump to things like that instead of the simplest conclusion or even a, like even what jumping to that conclusion instead of asking a single follow-up question you know like and it happens again later in the movie where they're like oh i guess the cia must have scrubbed every bit of evidence about this guy <laughs> he's <laughs> either like, a genius or, that's, or former fed there's nobody, nobody is bothering to ask him a single follow-up question, uh, except for the reporter who wants to, to get credit for, you know, talking about TV. Well, that's the thing. And I was like, is it kind of sweet that they're all giving him the benefit of the doubt? Or is it actually cynical that they're not digging further? Like, that's kind of the Rorschach t- t- like test that I was going through this whole movie. And- I think it's it's cynical in that everybody's giving him the benefit of the doubt. And I think it's your favorite scene It's my with favorite Louise scene. That... that says it yeah that explicitly talks about it so like which is another his first his talk show appearance that's another uh another great moment that we can talk about and in the middle of that talk show appearance we get to see everybody that he's met along the way watching him on this talk show including louise who's who's sitting there like i guess in the lobby of her apartment building watching it with everybody else and She's like, isn't this just a white Wait, man's Wait, I wrote America? down her like, whole all you monologue. Have to, yeah, because what, what did she so say? Good. Yeah, go ahead. It's for sure a white man's world in America. I raised that boy since he was the size of a piss ant. I'll say right now, uh, he never learned to read and write. No, sir. Had no brains at all. Uh, was stuffed with rice put- pudding, your line, between the ears. Shortchanged yeah. by the Lord and dumb as a jackass. Look at him now. <laughs> yes, sir. All you got to be white is, is be white in America to get whatever you want. Gobbledygook. And the most serious yep. gobbledygook I've ever seen in my life. She meant that. Yeah. Gobbledygook. Is she the only one he sees through him this whole movie? I think she is. I think it's yeah, just Louise. She is. Yeah. She is. But I love that scene because the whole entire movie, I'm getting like, first I like him, and then I'm getting mad. Because I'm like, okay, if this was anyone but a white man, and then Louise comes in and says, says it. She's like, yep. Yeah. yeah. yeah only a white man yeah, th- i mean that's <laughs> that that's the point of the movie yeah. you know like that it's just like the way that the way that we've built our society is such that a, somebody can just fall ass backwards into just fail upwards meetings with the president yeah. and just yeah like and i mean you know and in, in, in its eternal relevance in that that bit i mean how different is that than one person's you know hot take on twitter going viral and all of a sudden they're getting interviewed somewhere else and i'm not gonna undersell my love for, for louise by the way we haven't said her actress's name yet uh ruth attaway uh but like i don't know if this movie would have worked half as well for me without this character who's in maybe in three scenes yeah she's really important to contrast the narrative yes yeah, yeah she's so important to be there but speaking of which clan it's a. Uh... It's a performance review time at IGN. Maybe you and I should just go uh, go to the tailor and uh, just start dropping uh, gardening references around Corrado. Yep. And I will be there saying yeah. gobbledygook. Let's do that. I'm just going to find, uh, you know, I really would like to plant the seeds. Of Pal World? In a garden. You know, it's just like we got to plant the Pal World. Gobbledygook. <laughs> we got to plant the Pal World. It's March. Pal it's World's a- definitely <laughs> over. Uh <laughs> <laughs> It's a very meta joke. Yes. I mean, honestly, Louise and that and her energy for the win. God, I don't know if this movie works half as well for me without Louise. Well, and especially in that moment, right? Like how how far into the, the movie is that? Like it, it's it's it's, half, have the, it's the midpoint stamp. ish, it's, probably. It's a an hour twenty two. That's after he okay, meets the president. So, little, so he okay. meets the president yeah, 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 at the halfway yeah. point. Because he's only on the talk show because the president quotes him. Like the president Qu- meets him quote, and quotes, quotes him, him later that day in a speech, <laughs> especially at that point in the movie, you need that dose of reality. Cause I'm sure like, like the audience, like as the audience, I'm sitting there saying this, you know, I'm like, this is ridiculous that he keeps 
you know, failing upwards is not even the right word for it. You know, it's, it's just um, like middling but, upwards. He's not even doing anything upwards. wrong, he's but he's just, not doing anything right. Yeah, no, he's not he's said anything that could be held <laughs> against him. It's trees are healthy. Let's talk about, uh, because we're, we're running along. This is such a, such a good movie, but it, it, the dinner party sequence. The big amb- the Russian ambassador coming to visit, and Chauncey escorts Eve in place of Ben. You know, um, this this sequence is like at some point in this sequence, he's actually getting credit for not even being able to read, and he's getting credit like for pat- speaking Russian. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because he just giggled after the guy spoke. And by the end of the night, there's a guy that says like, I hear he's fluent in eight languages. And Oh, I hear he's also a doctor. And, and <laughs> they're asking Eve and Eve's like, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. Probably. The game of telephone in this scene is incredible. Yeah. It's, I also think my, my favorite part of the scene though is, and let's give, this is going back to the editing part of it. Um, throughout this, uh, this sequence, there's a couple of things going on, but one of my favorites is that we keep cutting back to the president being impotent. Yes. <laughs> like the, the, we keep cutting back to these quick little shots of the president and the first lady in bed. And she's like, I don't know, maybe we should see somebody about it. He's like, I'm not going to see anybody about it. <laughs> like the, it's, and it's just this quick little cut back to the president who is literally impotent. And then, you know, Chauncey Chance is at this, Russian ambassadors, you know, gala dinner party getting fawned all over for doing nothing. And it's, it's such a hilarious juxtaposition in, in this sequence. Maybe you should talk to somebody, darling. No. No, that... No, that wouldn't do any good. Hello, Ronald. How are you? And then you also cut back to that bar, the one bar that everybody goes to where everybody's like crossing paths and having separate conversations about him. Like the the lawyers are there talking about something and then the reporters are there trying to dig up stuff on him. And like, it's it's a remarkable sequence. No, I got the same thing from it. Like the whole president scene. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of weird like penis lines in this movie. I don't know. Maybe there's something human there. But I think we also have to talk about I like to watch and this man trying like basically like throwing himself at him. Well, I, I, I do love, I do love the line. Have you ever had sex with a man? And he's like, I don't <laughs> think so. And you believe him. He doesn't know. <laughs> he literally doesn't yeah. know. Cause he doesn't know what the word sex means. No. I'm sure no. that's what it is, but no idea. But he's yeah. like, is there a TV in that bedroom? <laughs> is there a then TV? Yes. There? Yes. I I, I, oh, he's like, you like TV. No, I on. like to watch. <laughs> Once we get to the president, you know, we'll also talk about Jack Warden and uh, yeah. where I where like so many good actors. I only I associate with just like late '80s, early '90s performances, just because that's when I saw them. Like I love Bruce Stern, but I feel bad that in my stupid lizard brain, I always just associate Bruce Stern with the Burps, despite the, the fact yeah. incredible '70s run of performances, right. but. He will always be the burbs for me. And Jack Warden will always be the grandpa in uh, Problem Child. You know what? I want to see my Bears fans in the comments. Brian song. That's the Jack Warden performance. The 1971 <laughs> ABC movie of the week. Brian song. Makes grown uh, men cry. He's, he's while you were sleeping to me. So we all. Saul from while you we we were sleeping. We all have our Jack Warden. The, the one guy that knew what Sandra Bullock was up to. And her one, her one friend in in the the farcical situation she found herself in. Uh, so I guess we'll see who's got a bigger fan base: the Chicago Bears or while you were sleeping. <laughs> it's um, while you were sleeping. Or problem it's child. problem child. Let's be real. Which oh, by the way, took place in Chicago. So John Ritter <laughs> and Kramer in it. All right, like that's something. That's something yeah. to brag about. What? So I, I don't think that we can. There's two other scenes that I know that we need to talk about. I think. Um, one is the the sex scene, quote unquote. <laughs> is that what you're calling it? <laughs> he likes to watch. He does like to watch, but again, like it, to escalate how people respond to Chant to Chance 
through the way that they have. I started calling him Chauncey to, too. <laughs> I started calling him Chauncey. I know. It's I hard. keep, I it's keep hard. correcting myself. His name is Chance. Everybody it's calls Chauncey. him Chauncey because of a misunderstanding. Um, he wasn't expecting to drink booze, but this, this, <laughs> the way that everything has escalated, that this is just the, the absolute natural conclusion of it, right? That surely even that Eve's character who has been so vulnerable and so lonely and sad and, and uh, like uh, this whole time to then sort of find some solace with, she's even gotten the green light from her husband. Like her husband gets it and like, it's it, it's such a bizarre moment. Well, it's funny, you know, that, but she like, comes in crying. Like she has tears all over her face. Yeah. She's clearly going through it. Her husband is dying. Yes, like and and her husband is dying. And slower also than a poor, like slower than he should be. <laughs> he should have been dead <laughs> yeah. twenty years ago at this rate. Which ultimately, <laughs> again, he's reconfiguring his house to hold more oxygen. <laughs> Yeah, and ultimately that's why he dies, right? It's because he's just tired of it. He's like, uh, no more. <laughs> he's cut it out. I'm good. But yeah, no, she she comes into the room, like face covered in tears, and and she ends up. I just and he's telling her that he just likes to watch TV, and she interprets that as like, oh, so so I should masturbate. <laughs> and it's, it's weird. And she does, innocent. and it's <laughs> it's so it's so strange, and also like the result of it is the next day they're having this conversation where she's like, I've just I feel lighter than I felt in years. Like you really opened me up to, to, you know, I'm, you know, you've changed my life. <laughs> well, that's where I was like, it's you're giving like, him too much credit, baby. You did that. You did that. Shirley yeah, McLean. And that's, that's the thing. It's like, you know, it's all stuff that's brewing in everybody's interaction with chance is something that they, that's, that's going on with them. Right. Like that's the nature of projection. And like that's what chance is, you know. He's ever he's just uh, this blank slate that everybody gets to be like, you know what? I need to cut loose and I need to masturbate on this bearskin rug, uh, and that's what's going to be the best thing for me right now. And it happens, and they give him credit for it. But to your point, it's not. It this was all a thing that you needed. But so. I will say, I, I they're not as much as, as as amusing as I found this movie. I don't think I laughed out loud a lot of times. I did laugh out loud when he started doing the handstand. It's just the most yes. absurd, like visual of him doing a handstand like a child while she's just writhing on the floor. It's it's comedy. Yeah, yeah that's that's really funny. He starts doing the like sit and be fit PBS. Yeah. Kind like of. he could just sit there and watch <laughs> TV, but no, like a child, he is trying to do a handstand on the bed. That yeah. is hilarious. Which again, like I and I think making the point here that he has not changed even a little no. bit. Like there's nothing, there's no there there with him. Like it's just, he's, he's nothing <laughs> like there's, it's, he's slate. just a complete, completely empty vessel for whatever anybody else needs to see in front of them doing bonkers, like eighties public access. Just yoga. the most childlike thing you can do while someone's orgasming yeah. next to you. <laughs> I, I, I think so. It's up yeah, there. It's certainly. up there. There might be something else that's high on that list, yeah. but. But that's a different podcast. No, I, I are you going to talk about the end? Because I'm not sure how I feel about the end. That's like the one. I was going to say, like, we've talked a lot about Rorschach tests and and projecting meaning onto things and the ending. Him walking on water, uh, literally walking on water at the end. And what what did that do for you guys? I don't think I like I'm going to be honest. I it removed some of the ambiguity to me because to me. And I would love to hear your thoughts. To me, it seems like it's them confirming that he's stupid Jesus. Like it is giving <laughs> him that power, you know, where I liked I liked not knowing if he had that power or not. The other interesting thing about the ending, too, is just like the scene before this, which we should talk about a little bit, which is they're deciding he's going to be the president of the United States during the yeah. Paul Bear, which do you, do you not realize what they're burying this guy in? It's. The pyramid with the eye. It's yeah. The, the, it's the what? what it's what, a pharaoh. What, it's the like they're, uh, they're burying. A, a what, what are they calling it? Oh, the eye of providence. It's a Freemason. It's a Freemason symbol, right? So you want to talk about like secret societies controlling America and stuff like that? That 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 this is literally a metaphor for that. They're burying the guy who's a Freemason, yeah. talking about who they're going to choose next for president of the United States, and then it cuts to you know him walking on water. Yeah. God. 
I also really like it's such a great shot. It's- the president is like, you know, he didn't want a lot of fanfare, so I'll read his own words. And his own words start with, I don't have time for people on welfare. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just, just like, They're so stupid. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's just but then yeah, and this is one with the line that I mentioned kind of up top where he hasn't said anything that can be held against him. And they literally decide our best chance to keep the presidency is Chauncey Gardner, which is is wild. And then he just goes he goes, he turns around, he walks on he wanders off, first of all, to play with sticks. In the middle of this he funeral. he saves the tree, I guess. But That's you giving know. him a lot of credit. I it's think. not. He yeah. throws the big stick off the little tree, makes sure the tree is standing, and then he goes and walks on water. You know, he's our savior. Yeah. I don't think I like it. I don't know. <laughs> I, what I do you guys what, think about I, the stupid Jesus thing? Do you think he's stupid Jesus? I, I I've mean, been stuck on this for twelve hours. Yeah, yes and no, right? Like, I, again, like, I think it's a, a deal where because it's a movie that's so, it's particularly the ending that's so open to interpretation, the idea that he's stupid Jesus is like, yeah, sure. I think the idea is that, like, at least he's got a know, good soul. People, people <laughs> see he's him. Pure, like, sure. I mean, we got tons of stupid politicians yeah. right now, and they're not necessarily the, uh, the Jesus type, <laughs> and whether whether or not he is actually stupid Jesus, it's the fact that this is what people see him as. They see him as a savior of of some type, and like to Cal to your point about him rescuing the tree, yeah, that is the better way to put it because he's he's there. He does actually tend to he things. he cares about the little trees, but yeah, but everybody else sees so much more in it. I tell you what, the one good thing that they did do with this ending. Not the one good thing, because I, I do I do like it. I, mm. I love me an ambiguous ending, but I'm just glad they didn't cut to a like Shirley MacLaine seeing him walk on water. You know, like good that point. would have ruined good the point. whole thing. But this is just this great little image, and like there was it. This wasn't the original idea. Like I think they shot an ending that Hal Ashby just didn't like, and so they went with this idea instead. Which I think you know. It had to have been a more literal ending the first time. If this is your plan B, like Probably. the first time had to have been a more like closed interpretation kind of uh, kind of moment. But the, it, it's also like the fact that he can just kind of wander out on water is in keeping with the rest of him, what he's done the rest of the movie. He just wanders out into the world and and ends up the front runner for president. Yeah, there's no consequences. <laughs> like, yeah, there's no consequences for this guy. I suppose that's the interpretation that I like. Not that he's some hero, just that he can just wander and get. Well, he's even confused by it. Like he he walks out a few steps and he turns around and looks. He's like, the hell is this? (laughs) uh, Wait, that's I think I like it better now that he's confused. Yeah. Yeah. Like he doesn't even get it, but he's also not going to argue with it because he keeps walking ahead and then starts to, to investigate another plant. Like. He's, um, you know, he, he has no idea what's going on, but he's just going to wander ahead and continue being a gardener. And that's it. Yeah. Well, we're talking maybe about like, it. So I think it did. Maybe shot. that's the, yeah, maybe the archetype of that is stupid Jesus, you know, like it's, but it's a great ending. I, I, I legitimately, me, I'll I, say, yeah. Yeah. No, no. And it's like you say, I mean, we're, we're talking about it. We're talking but. about it. Movie f- rips. I don't know what y'all are talking about. No, I like it. I like the movie. <laughs> too, I was yeah. just like, wait, he is stupid Jesus. Like, it made it less ambiguous He's stupid to me. stupid Jesus. What the hell? Well, I thought it would be good while our close friends are carrying Ben to his last resting place to read from his quotes. I have no use for those on welfare. Let's move on. Let's talk about movie lists. I honestly couldn't find one. I can't imagine that it's not been mentioned a bunch. I'm sure it's gotten honorable mentions over the years, but it hasn't made a you know it hasn't made it into the metadata anyway. So, uh, so I'm not real sure. But uh, I'm, I would wager it got shout outs in in things like satires. Um, uh, it's it's strange to talk about this movie like a comedy. It's a, I would say it's. I mean, the Globe said it was a comedy. Not that that means anything. Right. Oh, great. Um, so we'll put it on the funny. same list with The Martian. <laughs> the Martian yeah. was funny. You know, com- famous comedies. Like yeah, the famous, Martian famous comedies. <laughs> Are there any other lists that you think? Uh, this top 10 on? political movies. I think that this is probably one of the better sat- like political satires. And uh, it's 
move like it's people like Armando and Nucci who owe a lot to this movie because this movie is just so sharp and it's kinder than Armando and Nucci, but he very much swims in the wake of what this movie did like 30 years before. Yeah, he like if there stuff. wasn't a Chauncey around and everybody were super foul mouthed, it would it would be V. I don't know. There's something to me about like, and this would probably just be a personal preference list of like movies that stay relevant forever. I also like movies about pe- rich people being dumb. <laughs> dumb rich people movies? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really emerged, good, I think, that, in the last couple of years. It's a good list. Yeah, it, it's... Uh, I mean, you do that, and maybe that's part of what makes it relevant forever. It's just nobody ever likes to see rich people be smart. Unless they're Bruce Wayne or Tony Stark, and then we need them to be. I mean, yeah, it's not going to, like... It's too... It's too subtle to be on, like, a best comedy list, you know? It's... Just, right. It's it's real contribution is its social commentary. Yeah. Yeah, because like I said, I didn't laugh out loud at a lot of moments. I found it more amusing and interesting than uproarious. I think politics. Politics movies is where where it belongs. It's 2024, yeah, it bro. I don't think you've made it's election a top, year. top 10 politics movies, but... Uh, nope. Uh, I've got, what do you think? Does that need to go up on election night or? No, no, before? no. We want to get it out in time for the October surprise. So then we could surprise people with what our fa- with what our favorite politics movie is. I'll get it on the calendar. I've got, between now and October, I can, I can do that. Let's torf. Oh, we're torfing. Shall we? Let's torf. Okay. You guys ready? True or false? True or false? Yeah. Either one. All right. Shirley MacLaine's masturbation scene was shot 18 times. True or false? Oh, goodness. I'm going to say false because it was shot 37 times. Yeah, I'm going to go agree um, with Clint on you're, you're going up? Is that what you're... Uh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm going to say I, I do think that I think it was a minimal takes. Yeah. I, uh, Hal Ashby knows what he's looking for. Yeah. 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 He, he, he's shooting for the and I, I I don't think it would be 18. The only reason that it might be 18 is like the way that she like flops around a little bit at the start of it is so weird and goofy that I feel like they had to at least do more than one to get to that spot. So f- either way, false 18 is too many. This one's a little mean at uh, 17 times. Yeah. <laughs> we were 17 right. sounds right. Yeah. 18 yeah. way too many. Uh, but fun fact, uh, before Melvin Douglas got the part, they offered it to Larry Olivier and he turned it down because of the masturbation scene, which is goofy to me because he's not the one masturbating. Like he just thought it made it unserious or something. Huh. Like all it Lawrence says here is old he said Larry Olivier. Yeah, he said, I'm not doing this film because of the masturbation scene. Oh bull. Come on, Larry. That's, that's why I didn't do it. That's good for Hal Ashby for not taking the scene out. Yeah. yeah. He wouldn't have even been in that scene. He's not even in the like, room. That's what for I'm that. saying. That's so weird. You're not yeah. the one masturbating. Like what what's It's your... not even that, but his he because he wasn't was he gonna be Chauncey? No, he was going to be uh, yeah. the... He's going to be Ben, ben yeah. Rand, right? He's not even in the scene. Yeah, so he, he's not even in the scene. He's, yeah. he's literally dying in the other room yeah. while it's happening. Like, okay. Well, Whatever. fine. Whatever, Lawrence. That's two awful acting stories that I've heard from him. The, the other famous one from Marathon Man, uh, where Dustin Hoffman is like, spends the morning before they shoot the scene, like sprinting around Central Park to get all tired and exhausted and dirty and you know, for the scene, uh, at the end. And Lawrence Olivier says like, Oh, that's, that's interesting. Have you tried acting? Oh, God. <laughs> you can't just act tired. You have to go actually get tired. All right. Oh, that's a, that made me think of Brian Cox yeah. too, with his method acting response. Uh, I, I do kind of like actors. I'm making fun of method actors. <laughs> yeah, <it's fun. laughs> All right. Torf, true or false. Uh, to what we were just talking about that, that ending scene, uh, the South African Publications Control Board ordered that the final minutes of this film be cut from the South African release. True or false? I'll say I'll say true. Sure, why not? Unless it's a false because it was some other country. Some other, yeah. But we'll, we'll just say <laughs> we had our mean one, yeah. Tayo and I. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, the final minutes were cut because the scene showing Chance walking on the water surface, quote unquote, might offend many South African Christians. 
Uh, originally, there was a different last shot. Pl- what you're saying, Quint? Uh, there was a different last shot planned for the funeral sequence at the end of the film. Hal Ashby was chatting with another director one day about filming when he commented about how well everything was going. It's like walking on air, he said, and then suddenly was struck with a thought. He changed the last shot of the movie to the one that now appears in the movie. There you go. How fun. Had to build a whole platform in the water. No one's ever done that before. So wait, we got that one right. Yes, you did. Okay, good. The cinematography was done by Caleb Deschanel, the biological father of Zoe Deschanel. Yeah, that's true. And Emily, for that matter. Yeah. Bonus points, also Emily. Caleb Caleb Deschanel had he had himself a nice little run in the early eighties. Like he's he's worked forever and he's he's really good. But like between this and then he went on to the natural. And, oh, Tyus um, left me a list. We got we got Lion King 2019. We got Passion of the Christ. We got Abraham Lincoln Vampire yeah. Hunter. We got National Treasure. Lion King 2019. Was there anything to actually be shot there? What, he just shoot the kid on the blue screen? They had. <laughs> you know what? I don't know, actually. Yeah, didn't, didn't Favreau get... He got like, oh, I shut up about like wanting it to be an animated movie mm-hmm. or something like that. No, but you know, between the right stuff and um, the natural... He got he got a handful of Oscar nominations, sort of back to back there in the in the early '80s after this movie. This was, I think, his first feature. Oh, interesting. But yes, any uh, any she and him fans out there? This is she and him's dad. You guys don't like M Ward and Zoe Deschanel's music projects? They do great Christmas albums. You know. Anyway, next torf. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we we touched on this, but I need a definitive answer. This is the last film of Peter Seller. True or false? I mean, if he died false. the next year, it's false. Do you know he that? Did one more. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, Clint saved the, my ass. Um, false. It was the. It, this is a really unfortunate thing because it was a terrible movie. Uh, uh, the Adventures of Fu Manchu, or something like that. Damn close, Clint. I'm going to give it to you because that's yeah. damn close. The fiendish plot of Doctor Fu Manchu. There you go. I knew it was more elaborate than adventures, but yeah, no, he did. He did one other movie, and and it was it was just awful. He was trying to sort of go back to the Clouseau kind of kind of vibe, and it just just didn't work. Yeah, no, it it kind of sucks. Yeah, yeah. this would have been a good one to go out on. Yes, <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna die next year, at least just stop. <laughs> All right, uh, last one. We've spent some time talking about this, but this is an extra bit of it. Uh, being there inspired the band Fish to release a cover of the song. You said it right earlier, Clint. Sprech. Also, Sprech, Sprach Sprech, Zarathustra. Zarathustra. Fish did a cover of Fish did Sprech a cover? cover yeah, Zarathustra. Jesus Christ, how long is that you know song? What? Why like not? Yeah, probably. The, the jam band version. I mean, this funk version of it, I could see. It's great. Fish I don't want to hear Fish noodle about this song for an hour. <laughs> Why not? What? It's just uh, a lot. You'd have to see, you'd have to see him live too. It'd be a, it'd be a big accident to to do it. But true, I'm gonna go true. Yeah, that's one of those ones where I feel like it'd be like too crazy to make up. Yeah, that's true. It's a lot of nice. noodling. Yeah. Yep. Did we get all of them right? I think you did. Yeah, because yeah. the first one we were kind of like yeah. dubious on was the first, which we were right, but only because we of got the right. Year. That might have been and the first 100 percent torf. Full torf. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, who's your MVP? I'm going to say Seller. Peter Sellers? Yeah. I get everybody saying Sellers, but this is my favorite Hal Ashby movie. So I'm, I'm going Ashby. Yeah, I'm going Ashby. I'm going Hal Ashby. I, I'm going with Hal Ashby because I think that it's, Peter Sellers is incredible. Shirley MacLaine is incredible. But the thing about this is that everybody in the movie is incredible. And when everybody is working at this high level, including like the, the crafts people too, like including, uh, you know, Caleb Deschanel and, and Don Zimmerman, the editor, like he's in a, he's got some nominations under his belt too. Like it, Don Zimmerman has done everything from heaven can wait and being there in this earlier to like Ace Ventura pet. Like he did the first Ace Ventura movie. He cut a galaxy quest. Like he's, He's he's got a healthy healthy career on him at this point too, and like they were all working at such a high level that at that point you got to give it to the director. Like when everybody is doing that's Their that's a credit work. to career assembling. Best work. Yeah, that's a that's a credit to assembling the right team and then motivating them to pull in the same direction. Like that that's how Ashby. 
I'm, my counter argument, even though I don't disagree with anything you just said, is that there's a, a to, version the a version of this movie where Chance is unlikable or he's unfunny or he's too stupid that you don't believe the suspension of disbelief. You need to be just stupid enough. Yeah, but I think that's a director. I think that's, that's a, a that, director. That, that, that's, that's the inherent yeah. problem with the MVP segment is if an actor is really good, do you give it to the director for getting that out of them? Well, and I remember talking about the Babadook and and wanting to give it to Essie Davis instead of Jennifer Kent for exactly the opposite reasons that I'm talking about now. But um, you know, I do I do think honestly to to invoke a torf here, like if Hal Ashby is sitting there telling Lawrence Olivier no thank you, like he's got a hyper specific vision for this movie and he's not gonna let anybody mess it up. It would suck um, if he took out that masturbation scene. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's, it's clearly, and especially at this point in Ashby's career, like this is the, this is kind of the tail end of his, his like really, really incredible 10 year run. Like his seventies were, you can stack it against any decade from anybody, I think. Um, and this is kind of the tail end of that run. So he knew who he was and what he wanted and, and how to make a movie, how to make a Hal Ashby movie at this point. And I think he, I, I think he just nailed it. I think you could say all of that for Peter Sellers too, because he's also deep into his career too. Yeah. Well, and this is him rebounding too, because like he's, he's being, he's getting like made fun of, uh, in a lot of circles for doing, continuing to do Pink Panther movies and stuff like that. But, and what was the, 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 the mystery quote that I sort of found about like, I've never seen such a talented person make so many bad movies in Peter Sellers. And he came back for his almost final role. All the, all the stuff that I, you know, even down to like the lawyer, um, what's his name? Uh, Thomas, the lawyer who sees Chauncey on T or chance on TV and then leaves. And his girlfriend is mad that he's leaving. Like even those little performances are great. And then like all the stuff with the first lady leading up to the impotent stuff with the, with the president was just great. And it's all, it's all piled together in the right order. I think that any, you know, there's another version of this without Peter Sellers, with somebody else in that role. Uh, there's not another version of this without, without Hal Ashby. I think it needs Sellers. That's where I'm standing okay. my ground. So, I mean, Sellers is, the only one, Se Sellers is the only one that could have done this. Gobbledygook. It's Gobbledy my favorite cook. line in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, listen, if there is another version of this movie with somebody besides Peter Sellers, can it be Nick Cage? Oh, honorable mention for MVP, Ruth Attaway. We love Louise here. Yes. Um, Louise, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we but Nicholas Cage. We appreciate Louise in this house. Cal, where are you putting Nick Cage in this movie? It wouldn't be Peter Sellers' Chauncey Gardner. It would be Nicholas Cage's Chauncey Gardner, but he could do it. Yeah. It wouldn't be better. I'm not saying it would. I'm just saying it would be Nicholas Cage. Certainly be different. I think honestly, I think uh, let him be the president. I, that would be a funny spot to put him. Yeah, we need to give the president. We need to give the president a bigger role, though. Yeah, get some gray in his hair. Let him go a little bit like the frustration of not being a the frustration of not being able to figure out who this guy is. Let that boil over a little bit. That's and that's the fun. impotence. He's and really frustrated. Impotence. Yeah, and then for him to then have to like like bottle all that up for the on-camera president persona that he's got to do. Like that, that'd be fun. I think that's better. That might be better. Yeah. yeah. That might be how this movie gets better. As much as I love uh, Brian Song alum, Jack Warden, I would like to see Nicolas Cage as the president. Uh, you, about while you were sleeping, Jack Warden. You give, you give Nicolas Cage some Valium and just have him start spouting <laughs> off like some, uh, some like gardening, some gardening metaphors. And I think you have yourself a movie here. I don't know. I, don't, I think all you I, get all you get is another. Why couldn't you put the bunny back in the box? It's different. It's so. kind of like when we, as an experiment, put uh, Nicolas Cage as the lead of the Babadook. Like it's different. <laughs> I don't think it's better, but it's different. No. Yeah, but it's I just mean, The Shining. There are a few. There are a few people that are Peter Sellers, though. That's all yeah. I'm saying. Well, I think uh, two against one. He's he's. We're putting him as the president. Current current day Nicolas Cage, little grandpa gray hair, as the president. Where'd you guys have this ranked? Uh, Alex, I heard you offhandedly mention watching it for the first time last I, night. Sometimes so I, I feel assume, bad for spoiling it, but no, I, I it's not on my list. I think it's fine. Yeah. 
Cal? I had it at 57. 57. Okay. 57. Kind of the halfway mark. I uh, am told that Dan didn't have it ranked at all. And once again, Dan and I line up in a really unfortunate way. I didn't have it on my list. This is not a movie that I've revisited in quite some time. Do you have other Hal you know, Ashby? Do you have other Hal Ashby on your list? No, I don't. I don't think that I do. He I doesn't have to even check. get one. Listen, yeah, at least which you, is listen this, again. Like he is the most unheralded <laughs> '70s director that there is. To the point where, like, I'm a big fan of his, and I didn't even put him on my list. Are you list. doing a Harold like, and Maude pun when you say that? Listen, like at least you and I could disagree on what crony should be included. Sure, but you I don't even have you don't even have one Hal Ashby here. I didn't even I didn't even. To bother to put Harold and Maude on here. Is that your, is that your, um, is that your bop? Is that your favorite Hal Ashby movie? No, honestly, being there is like I don't. know. It's just one of those. It's another one of those dangers of making a list. Like, hey, sit down, and make the write down your hundred favorite movies of all time. Like, I didn't rewatch every movie I've ever seen. You know, that's that's part of what's what's fun about this. But would you I, put I'm sitting it, here going would like, you regret it? I think there's probably a few movies on here that I do regret that I would happily. Bounce Hal Ash. Hal, um, for Hal Ash. For, for, Hal. for a Hal Ash. Yeah. For Hal Ash. Just if nothing else, like the work that guy did. And, and honestly, that era of filmmaking is so much fun. Uh, it deserves a spot in my list, but it doesn't have it. But happily now, because we got to, to boot the burbs, which I did have on my list. It sounds like you've already cleared up the spot for it. I'll just clear the spot. I'll just take burbs off and put put this wherever because that's where it belongs i'm sure so what is that what does that algorithmically do to well this was a there? not 100 i don't know we have oh, yeah. this thing we have this thing here so wait so does it just take the burbs place i think so that's what we did with with monty python i think so yeah all right so ooh, tayo producing doing some doing some producing here there so you go. the old ranking was 176. Ah, so just on the strength of you alone having it at 57. And then you guys vetoing it. Puts it at, so now it's at 62. I don't know, I don't know how the veto math works here, by the way. <laughs> I mean, we it just, we swapped it out. Works, to be yeah. fair. So now it's 62. Okay. That's pretty high, honestly. I, that's, that feels, it's a great movie. It's, it's great. Cra- movie. Yeah. I'm mad I, about it. I'm going to I'm going to end up revising my top 100 to include it, I'm sure. Uh I don't know that I'm going to go as high as 62. It'll be up there though. It's going to be there. I I do really enjoy this movie. So I guess we we now don't have to do the community thing where we boot it because we just booted one last week in favor of this one. Better movie, better discussion, you know. It it is a fun one to talk about, I will say. It is. Well, those open-ended movies. It's just like we're, we're having as much fun as everybody watching Chauncey on TV was having, thinking about like, hey, we're going to be all right now that that guy's in charge. Listen to him talk about gardens. Um, but I think that ought to do it. Any, any other parting thoughts on being there? Other than it rips. And it does rip. I, I do. Was, honestly, I very much my, begged for us to like try and do a, poli- did a, a political it, movie because it's a, an election year. Was that where I, your thought um, was? Yeah, absolutely. I love this movie. But the election yeah. year. That's yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I have a list Director of election. Director of video I have programming. A, I, have a, <laughs> I have a list of election movies that I'm going through because I I love the Doom Scroll. I don't know if you know that about sure. me. I'm a big fan. This is going to be a block. That's terrible. It's going to be a blockbuster year of Doom Scrolling. I'm very excited. You're going to you're going to get around to a Manchurian Candidate. And oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Bullworth. Uh, the other the other the just side note here. The other political movie I watched recently, which is one I'd never seen before, is that it's called Winner Kills, and it's kind. It stars Jeff Bridges, and it uh, it's kind of like a kennedy assassination movie but not kennedy it's like on a reimagined kennedy assassination and hmm. jeff bridges plays the brother of a kennedy of, of G, like, like the proverbial jfk who gets assassinated right. and then he just goes down this rabbit hole of conspiracy theories to try and figure out who killed this brother very good never heard of this movie until like a couple of weeks ago when i started just like compiling my list of you know politics movies yeah very, very, very right. fun watch. What year is well, it? You're gonna have to. Re- 
1979. Same year as go. this. Same year. What a what a year for movies. Yeah, 1979. Dude, dude. All right, just let me l- l- listen. We got Jeff Bridges. <laughs> go we got. L- let me just rattle off this cast here, right? Yep. Jeff Bridges, John Huston, Anthony Perkins, Sterling Hayden. Oh yeah. You know. 70s Sterling Hayden was rad. I, I do like Altman's Lost. I'm not a big Altman guy, but Altman's Lost uh, Long Goodbye is yeah. great. Oh, great. I'll, I mean, for, for one of my all-time lines is, the fluids, man, Drake. The fluids, man, The Drake. fluids. To Peter Sellers. To Peter Sellers. Well, that, uh, that I think, now that we found our way back to Peter Sellers after that tangent, is probably going to do it for us after this week. After that gobbledygook. Gobbledygook. Um, thank you for watching this, not top 100, but now top 100. Uh, maybe that's what we should call these episodes. A now top 100. Ooh, Ooh now top 100. top 100. I don't know. Now I we're producing like that's again. Mixing, that's us. mixing too many brands. It's going to earn our way on, on, it's going to earn its way onto, onto our list. If Dan's algorithm can ever truly be defeated. But, uh, also thank you, of course, to our producer, Tayo Yakin, technical producer, Mariah and Franzen. Our DP, Jamie Parslow, and uh, Dan, uh, I, he changed the channels in the middle of me talking just now. I can, I can just feel it. So no thanks will be given to Dan once again. Uh, come back next week when we will be watching uh, Shifting Gears Dramatically into a discussion <laughs> of Princess Mononoke. Uh, <laughs> we're going to go straight from being there to finally some Miyazaki. So uh, look forward to that. And in the meantime, stay safe, be good. We'll see you next time.